we're approaching 1014 where John Glenn, Scott Carpenter, Waterstraw, and Gordon Cooper all went into orbit. The last four worker launches was on this pad right here, pad 14. We also used the same pad for the Gemini launches for the target. Uh, the Atlas E's and Atlas F were used for the targets. The Atlas D's were for the human beings. Now, folks, over here on the left, John Glenn was here a while back, and he took his his little label that says John Glenn right there, and then they put a new one out because he wanted his. But uh, you can see, yeah, he was the guy who got Then right here it says launch director. That was uh, T.J. O'Malley. Yeah. Remember T.J.? T.J. O'Malley could never find his roll bag. It used to be a dirt roll over there. He could never find his turn. They put that bite up out there for him. They called it the O.J. Uh, O'Malley's guiding line. <laughs> so they always teased him about that because he never could find his pen. Okay, now the rocket will be on the left-hand side over there. They'll go for a ramp, and the umbilical tower will be over here on the left. But to the left of that the concrete, that's where the rocket will be situated. The Atlas rocket, you can see it in your book. You can see what page it's on. So you know what I'm talking about. The Atlas, this is where John Glenn, Scott Carpenter, Washington Hood, here it is, page 22. 22. This, this is pad 14. This is where Alan Shepard said, well, I guess they just got rid of that one. John, I sure hope I can fix that. This is the place. This is the place. <laughs> Don't you just love it? <laughs> John Glenn was considered the cleanest astronaut we've ever had. Would you like to know why? He was scrubbed ten times. <laughs> That's pitiful, isn't it? That's good, Paul. That's good. Oh, what, what, what? Oh, what's your podcast? Now, we're going to go down here to the scoreboard of Pad 19. Now, the Geminis were lost down here. The Type 2 rockets. Folks, what does Gemini mean? You get below your target because the distance around here can be lower orbit. is a shorter distance than the one above it. That way you can catch up. And after they call it, they simply used the reaction control system to simply move up and dock. And they had no problem with that at all. And they all had a good time of it. We spent several weeks in space living together, that kind of thing. It must have stuck bad inside there. Don't you think so, folks? It must have been bad in there. <laughs> okay, here's the scoreboard. Gemini type number three was Gus Grissom and John Young. Remember John Young? Gus was the commander, and John Young was the pilot. Gus was in charge. And NASA told John Young, John, you can eat Gus, you can't. Oh, and I take Gus off. Gus says, I'm mad about this. And so anyhow, uh, John Young told that to Wally Sherrod, how Gus got so mad about that. And so on the day of the launch, uh, Wally went to, uh, to Whoopi's over, over in Cocoa Beach and bought a corned beef sandwich. And he brought her back, he gave it to John Young, and he slipped into his fly pants, and they got up there, and about the time John Young was going to eat, Gus started complaining. And so John Young put out this sandwich and said, here, Wally gave us this, let's eat this sandwich. And they did. And they got in trouble, too. Because all, all, all the crumbs got into the vents. Right. Now, folks, six and seven were opposite. See how they did this in line? Let me tell you why. Given a tight number six, the target on pad 14 exploded. And they couldn't launch. They had no target to launch with. So they went ahead and launched Gemini Titan number seven. They were up there getting ready, getting ready to rendezvous at the target. And somebody got the idea. I don't know which one, either Frank Boomer or Jim Lovell. They called up the engineers in, in, in St. Louis. And the St. Louis engineers called up President Johnson. And they said, why don't we launch Gemini number six anyway and rendezvous with people instead of the target, Kennedy. And John said, well, that's a darn good idea. And so they launched those guys. And ladies and gentlemen, they got within one foot of each other, that close. The Russians have never been within a mile of theirs. We were within one foot of ours. It's not bad. That's when we, we, we caught up with Russia. It was right around in there. Either five, six, or seven, we caught up with Russia. Gemini number eight, the number four thrust malfunction. They had to come home early. They were spinning in a circle. They were getting dizzy. They came home early. And, uh, and, and also when, it, uh, when Buzz Aldrin went up from Gemini number 12, he took a sextant with, sextant with him. He went to MIT and he knew all about rendezvous docking and, and how to do stars for telemetry. And he knew where they were before NASA knew. That's what he said. <laughs> he was a smart man, folks. Let's, let's go, sir. Oh, he did a lo the longest spacewalk, too. But he was, uh, before that, they had a lot of problems with Oh, by the way, the one of the spacewalks he's talking about is Gemini number four, when Ned White did his spacewalk. Did you know 
No, no, take that back. Take that back. It did fine. He was going to miss it. The guy that did the, the space flight had trouble with was the Mr. Mike Sutter. Gene Cernan was what? No, no, uh, number nine. Okay. Gene Cernan could not get back in. And so Tom Stafford radioed down to NASA and says, hey, I can't get him back in. What are we going to do? The instructions of NASA to Tom were, leave him out there, shut the heads, bring him home on the umbilical cord. He got in. <laughs> and after that event, that's why they built the pools in Texas. Remember those pools they built for work, work in space? That's why they built them. It was because of him. So they could practice walking in space. <laughs> Are you guys having fun? Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's let's go, sir. If you look to the right, you can see the the, the blockhouse to the right had 19. And that was considered one of the largest blockhouses around. There was the umbilical target on that pad back there was 109 feet tall. It used hyperdolic fuel. And by the way, in the old days, liquid oxygen cost about 60 cents a gallon. Hydrogen cost about a dollar a gallon. The nitrogen trioxide, which was the oxidizer for the hypergolic fuel, was $223 a gallon. And the uh, unsmelted dimethylhydrazine was $445 a gallon. Big difference. And if you got it on your skin, you were dead in about 15 minutes. And on pad 19, there were showers there. You, you took a shower if you wouldn't survive. If you breathe it in, say goodbye, you're going to die anyway. Your lungs turn to water. It's scary stuff. But it was a very powerful rocket. It was 109 feet tall. It would generate 430,000 pounds of thrust in the first stage and about 1,000 pounds of thrust in the second stage. So Gemini's were Titan II rockets. Titan II rockets, not Titan 1s. Now we're going to turn down here and go down to pad 34 where those guys died. That's blockhouse 34 there. Folks, the door on that blockhouse weighs 23 tons. And and folks, there's a way to escape in case that door got blocked by a rocket exploding and all the debris getting from the door. There were underground tunnels. I'll show you a little bit. Now, now there's, there's two floors. There'd be over 300 people in the blockhouse. That's a lot of people, isn't it? And the second floor was on springs because of the shock of the liftoff. Something else. Fat quick. Fat quick. Fat quick. Fat quick. Fat quick. Fat quick.